Hello, I want to welcome you again. This is Rob Califf. We, we're doing our series on the life and times of famous cardiologists. And I'm really pleased today to have Valentin Fuster with us, someone who I've admired for a long time and has a very interesting history, which is still evolving as he's currently living a double life between the United States and Spain. I think we'll have a really fun interview today. And Valentin, welcome to the Thanks very program. much, Rob. So what we really try to do with these programs is to give uh, the listeners and viewers an opportunity to hear about who you are and what motivates you and what you'd like to accomplish. And I've had a lot of people tell me, gee, you know, I didn't know that uh, he was doing or she was doing so and so. And um, I've thought differently about my life because of what they've been through. Where, where was I it? I would that like to interview you. <laughs> Some but people have go. said that. Where did you grow up? Well, I was born in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, I went to medical school in Barcelona, and the day I finished medicine, I got married, and I left uh, for uh, Edinburgh. Well, for those who are not um, experts in European geography, many of us have heard about, you know, Spain is a little divided among different cultures. What, what was it like in Barcelona compared to the rest of Spain, and how would you contrast it with life in the U.S.? Well, uh, my life in Barcelona was during a dictatorship. Uh, it was the Franco regime, and there were many barriers at that time. Um, in terms of what you could say, you couldn't say, and this really was infiltrated at the university level. So uh, it, it is difficult to, to say um, what Catalonia, Catalonia was with respect to the rest of Spain, because this was a dictatorship to the whole country. But Catalonia was characterized by, uh, by individuals, uh, hardworking, very uh, creative, and certainly the region in the country at that time that was economically contributing the most. And what did your parents do for a living? Well, uh, my father was a psychiatrist. I should uh, have known. <laughs> yeah, my father was a psychiatrist, and so my uh, eldest brother, he's in uh, UCLA actually, at, uh, uh, working in neuroscience. My grandfather was an interesting person who I wrote the biography. He was the, um, the dean of the university, the president actually of the university in Barcelona for a number of years. And at that time, uh, you were not only in the graduate and postgraduate responsibility, you were also in the other undergraduate, starting from age five. Wow. And uh, I think he contributed uh, a lot into uh, a free system, and that is to be able to go to school uh, free of charge. The public system. And the public system. And so um, I was very influenced uh, socially by what I learned from him when I wrote the biography. So he's a family of doctors. He's also my, my father's father was a general physician. Oh, so. wow. Wow. So you really had it yeah. built into you from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. And what about your mother? Well, my mother, uh, you know, my father had a private clinic uh, near home, a psychiatric clinic, and my mother really was managing it. Ah. So a family business, so Yeah, to speak. a family business. Extraordinary person, actually. Uh, she died at age 101, and she still used to catch a bus at age 90 uh, and go to shopping. Very active woman. And you had one brother? Five. Five brothers. But one of them is, as I say, is a physician scientist. And then uh, two other brothers. Uh, actually are economists, and my, uh, my sister is an administrator in a hospital. Wow, so four, so four boys and one girl. Right. So your mother had a very tough job managing the business and yeah. the home front. I am the youngest of all, so perhaps I was <coughs> more free than all the others. So you, you had the benefit of, uh, they had worn her down already. Great benefit. You, you were allowed to do things you wanted Great to do. Great benefit, yeah. So in, in the, uh, in the Franco regime, I mean, a lot of us have heard about it, but um, you, you were there. What, what was it? You said you couldn't say some things, but was it more severe than that? How much limitation? It was very severe. The thing is, uh, you don't have relatively uh, speaking, you don't have 
any comparison because this is your all your life. I mean, this is what I can say. Uh, in retrospect, was very severe, um, <coughs> and uh, certainly history will judge. Uh, but uh, uh, at the university, uh, any kind of uh, uh, small uh, strikes and so forth, uh, you really were penalized. Uh, it was very difficult. Did anything really bad happen to your friends, or were you? Uh well, no, I think the, uh, yeah, uh, many of my friends went to prison and for a period of time for saying things that uh, uh, were not according to the government. But I, I think that what I remember from, the, from those years is still you, would, you could be able to do things out of the politics that would make you to be very free. And in this regard, I'm very thankful to my father, who was a psychiatrist, and and a good guidance, but certainly uh, gave uh, me a lot of freedom. So it was, a, it was a paradox what you had between the political scenario and then the personal life I had at home, which was quite uh, uh, interesting. Uh, do whatever you want to do if you like it. This was the guiding, for, was very, very important to me. Did you all talk about politics around the kitchen table? I know in Barcelona you eat dinner at an ungodly hour like midnight or something, right? <laughs> Maybe more uh, <laughs> uh, after midnight. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think at that time, uh, my, uh, particularly at home with my father, was, very, uh, was an intellectual person, uh, very interested in history. Uh, and uh, so we had uh, significant discussions about the, uh, the present scenario. Today the discussions would be quite different though, I would say. At that time was more about uh, the history of uh, Spain. Today it would be about what is going on in the world in the today world. and how Spain fits into the social economic. Uh, it, it was a completely different kind of uh, discussion, I would say. Now, this may sound silly, but I, you, you, for people who haven't lived in, in Spain or spent much time there, you do eat dinner very late. I've never understood how can you stay up so late and then function the next day? What, well, what's the, 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 what's question, the key? The question is, do you function the next <laughs> day? I would like to do a randomized study or a crossover study and see how cognitive function works. Uh, it, it, it's this is a question I don't have the answer, and I ask this myself all the time. Uh, in the south of Spain, however, or in, uh, in areas that are hot, one could have the siesta. And the siesta, the origin has to do with the temperature. Uh, people at midday, uh, they are at home and they sleep for an hour or two. And that can counteract uh, the problem of going to bed at night. But I don't think uh, today, still people go to bed very late and they don't have a siesta. So I wonder. Fascinating. So wh when did you decide that you were going to leave? You, was it early in your life? You always knew you would leave uh, when you finished your basic education? Well, first of all, um, I am a physician by, by environment or chance because I wanted to work in agriculture. In fact, the, um, I wanted uh, research in the field. I like nature tremendously. And the problem is Barcelona didn't have a university at that time. So I had to move to another city, and we are very family-oriented. You don't move easily. So I stay in Barcelona, and uh, I had lots of thoughts about actually uh, uh, dedicating my career in sports or uh, doing something else. But finally, I decided to go to medicine. The environment really contributed to that. Once I was in medicine, uh, from the very beginning, I knew I was going to leave because um, I was not happy about the way that education was very, uh, at that time at least, was very theoretical, uh, not practical. So um, after the first year, I decided that uh, I would leave after finishing. And certainly every summer, I left for a month or two to uh, particularly, I think it was the UK, it was the first two summers. Well, you, you brought up something I wanted to, uh, reminded me to ask you about. I, I don't normally think of you as an athlete, but as I understand it, you were quite a tennis player. Is that Well, uh, I, I like it, the sports. Uh, I dedicated many, many hours to tennis. And, uh, and one day when I was um, going to be selected with the Spanish team of uh, Orange Ball, this is like uh, 
the young people, like the Davis Cup, the young people. That summer I didn't play too much. I was supposed to come to Miami, and, and then we did a tournament. I, um, I lost. And that day I decided to quit. It was very interesting. Uh, it was just in a few hours I said, you probably don't have a future here and I quit completely, and I didn't touch a racket. I was playing about three, four hours a day. I didn't touch a, bracket for, uh, a racket for 10 years. Wow. So this was a decision, uh, very, very succinct decision, and um, so I think it's probably right. Sounds like a characteristic of your life to focus on things that you're doing. Uh, I, think, I think that uh, all of us uh, probably reach a stage where the decision has been made and it slowly moves into the explosive moment. And I think uh, I had a number of those, uh, all very positive, but I think it's all was building and this was a particular one. So you, f you, uh, you said you got married and moved. Yeah. What about your wife? What, how, did, how did you meet? Well, uh, actually, uh, we met in Barcelona and after six months of knowing her, uh, we said, uh, I'm going to Edinburgh to spend two or three years, and when I come back, we'll get married. And she says, no, we are going to get married before, and we go, and that's what we did. And we spent uh, three years in Edinburgh with a very good scholarship from Spain, and there I had the opportunity to, to begin to, to uh, uh, to, to do things that were quite interesting. With Desmond Julian, I was his right-hand person, seeing all his patients. I learned a lot from him. Uh, he was a remarkable old man, wasn't he? And then was also Michael Oliver there, uh, who was more a conceptual person. I, I had a very good time. These were uh, excellent three years, but maybe it's interesting for you to know a detail. In a summer, two summers before, I was in Liverpool learning pathology with uh, Professor Sheehan, and as a student, I was left there with lots of containers looking at hearts, but nobody was paying attention to me. So it was a tennis tournament. This was after six years that I decided to quit. So I got into the racket for the first time. I beat at everybody, and I became really a hero in a few hours, to the point that's the letter of recommendation that led me to Edinburgh. Was Your tennis excellence. My, my t <laughs> so you can <laughs> never forget what you learn because it may come back. And this is a reality. Uh, wow. The way I got into, into Edinburgh. So Edinburgh and uh, Barcelona are different places, <laughs> to put it mildly, right? I mean, Edinburgh well, is a dark, uh, cold place a lot of the time. Yeah, I think the Edinburgh, uh, you mentioned Edinburgh, and then you, we can talk about Rochester, Minnesota, where <laughs> you spent 12 years. These are obviously environmentally very different, very different cities. As you say, the uh, Edinburgh is dark, just by definition. But in a period of learning, who cares? I mean, the, uh, the, we had a great time. We just got married before, and, and uh, we had three years there, extraordinary years in every respect, uh, personally, professionally, and so forth. So I think the city didn't make much difference to me, uh, although today it would be difficult, I think. So if we uh, went back to the time you finished at Edinburgh, what were you thinking you were going, your career would be like? What were you well, focused on? Well, I was planning, on? yeah, I had a great mentor. Uh, th this is something uh, you learn. If I didn't have that mentor, I don't know where I would be today. This was um, a very well-known physician, uh, internist in Spain, who wrote the, uh, the textbook of medicine that was used in the country, in Spanish-speaking countries. And he said to me when I finished medicine, I said, I want to leave. I said, you should. But where do you go? Uh, I asked him, do I go to the United States or to the UK? He says, the UK into a small place because that's where you can build up your self-esteem as a professional. It's very interesting. Uh, and this will happen. When I finished Edinburgh, I said, at least I have to get the taste of the United States. And I applied to San Diego with Eugene Brownwell and I was accepted. And what happened at the last minute, it was a problem with the visa. I couldn't go there, so I was left nowhere, 
And through a friend, I contacted Mayo Clinic, and uh, I got a job there in a few days, and that's how wow. I spent not one year, as it was planned, just 12 years. <laughs> and life got complicated. And that was, a, again, a great experience. Who was the contact at Mayo Clinic who uh, helped you? Actually, the contact was Jackie Spitel. Jackie Spitel at that time was the head of education. And he was very kind. Since I was already trained in the UK, they, uh, I was able to go through the boards and so forth with less number of years than required. And he was the one who actually recruited me at Mayo. And then from then on, uh, you know, we, um, I got uh, really involved with great people. Uh, and the, uh, the two that I remember the most, one is a cardiac surgeon, uh, Dwight Magoon. He was a tremendous mentor to me, very good friend. And the other, of course, was Bob Fry, who was always very sensitive to the people uh, moving from other countries to, to Rochester, very sensitive. The, these, he's loved by all of us. He is a man who, um, when you go around the country and talk to people that have spent any time at Mayo Clinic or who have worked with him, they just admire him. Yeah. And, but he's so soft-spoken, he's like he has no ego. Well, he must no, have an ego somewhere in there. No, but he, he, he's a person who I think he has a charter, and the charter he has is to help. Uh, and I think certainly this is not an ego, but certainly it's a mission. And this mission that he has was always there, particularly on people he, he, might, he might have considered needed more help. He was always there. Uh, that, that's uh, really remarkable yeah. that a person in his position would have yeah. that yeah. attitude. So when your first job at Mayo, what were you doing specifically? What were you hired to do? Well, I, I finished the training program and then I became a member of the staff. And um, I was told very early that if I wanted to do research, which I always wanted 50% of my time, this was clear to me, I should get an NIH grant. And actually I got it. Uh, as I was moving from fellow to staff. And, uh, and I, it's interesting, I began to work with uh, pigs with von Willebrand's disease, uh, which have uh, completely uh, knocked out platelet function. They were homozygous. And this is where I learned platelets were important in vascular disease, uh, because these pigs did not develop the disease. And this was my takeoff in, in, in vascular biology and, uh, and certainly in thrombosis. Early on, you were sort of also known for work in valvular disease and other areas, and then you really focused on vascular disease. Well, I think, no, we all have hobbies, and you have a number of them. Uh, I always say to the fellows, you have to work on a project that is risky and is going to make your life if you succeed. But enjoy and do other things. You know, I work on uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, probably the first natural history study at Mayo primary pulmonary hypertension and anticoagulants. Tetalogy of Fallot, by the way, with John Kirkland, one of the best experiences of how to write a paper. That paper I wrote it 20 times, which was the first 500 cases of Tetalogy of Fallot operated at Mayo Clinic. I think this was irrelevant. What was relevant is John Kirkland telling you how to write. I learned to write from him. It was unbelievable. That's another connection we both have. Um, you know, John Kirkland, when he went to Alabama, became very interested in databases. Yes, so absolutely. I spent a lot of time with him, and he was amazingly organized. And one thing he taught me, he called me up one day and said, you know, we're going to have this meeting next week, and there are a lot of people there with different opinions. I'm going to get everybody to agree before we have the meeting so that we'll meet. The meeting will be very short, and we'll all walk away happy. And it was remarkable to see how he made things happen in a very organized way. Well, I way. think you have been very lucky, as I have been. Uh, uh, people don't realize the importance of a mentor, somebody who really uh, believes in you, or somebody who is committed to you. And I was so lucky, like you. I think these are critical people who really model your life. So you, you've uh, pointed out a number of those in your career. Um, but institutions, in a way, can sort of leave a mark on you also. What, what is the key to the Mayo Clinic? Why is it such a remarkable place? Uh, you work on automatic mode. Everything works. You are just as part of a piece of an engine. 
and if you are stupid, you become clever. It's an unbelievable uh, institution, well organized, and, um, and if you are a patient, uh, you know you are going to be taking good care from. So I think what you, what you learn at Mayo Clinic is, uh, is an institution that obviously uh, many, many years uh, that was built nowhere, so they were able to, to grow from zero without the pressures of the environment and, and ended up with a, a fantastic, uh, a fantastic uh, success, certainly for people who are trainees. Um, so what I remember from Mayo is that if I had to be trained again, I would go to Mayo. This is what I remember. Interesting. So you went from there then to Mount Sinai, quite a different Well, place. that was interesting, uh, <laughs> talking about my wife, you asked before. Um, yes, I had a phone call from Dick Gorlin, who was the chairman of medicine one day, and says, I have a job for you to come to New York in cardiology in Mount Sinai. And I said, I'm sorry, but I'm very happy here at Mayo. I had been at Mayo for 12 years. I went home and I told my wife, I said, look, I had a phone call today uh, from Dick Gorl in New York, and I just said, no, he says, what? <laughs> I have been following you for many years, and she's been interested in art history. Now is the time to go to New York and I can study art history at Columbia. That's what happened. In fact, it's one of the few occasions in life that, that those of us who are hardworking and very uh, guided decide you know she's right so the move to uh, to new york was very much uh, uh, because of that i was afraid of new york uh, those buildings and uh, <laughs> lack of individuality i thought and so forth it has been fantastic uh, i think the um, the the new york has something that is uh, is the diversity that you don't see anywhere and that diversity make you grow very rapidly and mature, understanding people and so forth. But I will tell you something about New York. You asked me before, what do you remember of Mayo Clinic? And I said I would be educated again there. New York, I will tell you something about New York. New York, either you beat the city or the city beats you. In other words, if you are able to manage that city, you get a tremendous degree of confidence that makes you move, experiment, and so forth, but there are not many people who can survive that. It's so tough, isn't it's it? A, it's a tough city. So I would say that I'm so happy in New York because at least I believe I have been able to manage the city, although I have been twice in New York, and the first time was more difficult than the second. How's that? Uh, it's difficult. It's a, I was head of cardiology, and, and this is a city where if you're head of cardiology, the patients, the complex patients come to you, and if you don't have time, a trustee calls you, and, and you are under tremendous pressure. And at one point when I was asked to go to Boston, I thought about it, and I said, you know, I'm under so much pressure in New York that maybe I can go into, I like research, I can go into maybe an academic uh, environment and, and, and so forth. So it was a number of factors that really play a role. And, and uh, so I think this is, this is um, this, that pressure uh, that New York had on me had a lot to do with my move to Boston. So is it, is it fair for me to conclude from this? I mean, the Mayo, it's a team. Yeah. You know, I'm an admirer of basketball where yeah. teamwork yeah, beats so. individuality. Um, yeah every time so you um there's a complementarity of the people that and then you went to new york where the individual may be a much yeah bigger factor it's the individual but is a very open society it, you know is an individual um you would say there's ambition there but you know your friend your neighbor you know what they are after i think this is uh, very very helpful in other words you know what the game is uh, in new york but i will tell you the challenge in new york and i um in a very humble way, I want to say, the challenge in New York is to make a team. If you can make a team and integrate the team in New York, I think it's unbelievably rewarding. A lot of opportunity. Yeah, a lot of opportunity. Well, you had a short stay in Boston. A I'm lot, sure there are a lot of short, stories. I remember very long. <laughs> it was over three years, and uh, it was interesting. Uh, it was an interesting time. Uh, um, 
uh, that, that certainly had an impact on me, positive impact, despite that uh, was not perhaps the best professional period in my life. What, what, what happened there? What, what, what did you take away from that? It was a personal issue. Uh, so I think that what I took away from Boston is that uh, the number of fellows who were with me, many of them are in, in New York today. Talented people, uh, exciting, stimulated, uh, uh, and so forth. But uh, he, he, I think it was a very competitive environment, and, and, and I just got across into uh, one or two individuals who I thought was not worth it for me to to stay there. It's as simple as that. So they offered in New York anything I wanted to go back. I did, and that's my second time in New York. It has been fantastic. So I, I'm interested in whether you agree with this. So I've often told people the higher up you get in an, any organization, um, actually the more important the person either right above you or parallel to you becomes because if you don't get along, it's I can tell miserable. you, I can tell you what you said is so important. Uh, and I, I have two examples. One is the example of Boston we commented on. And the other is the example in New York at this time. Uh, we have a, a dean, uh, de, uh, Dean Charney, who when uh, he came to New York about a few years ago, he got into my office, into his office. Uh, I was, he asked me to go and visit him. I didn't know him. And he said, you know, anything you do, I am with you. Move forward. I mean, what a difference. And that's what made my life in the last certainly five years. And, and now I'm very, very excited. So I think, I think the people we work with, uh, who do we report to, uh, is absolutely critical. And if I can give um, an advice to a young person, be sure that the person who recruits you is the one you are going to uh, report to. What you should never do is to be recruited for some, uh, from somebody and then you report to somebody else. This is basically an advice I would give. Uh, that that uh, sounds like very good personal advice for, for people. So um, as you came back to New York, you really broadened out from being sort of a, an expert clinician with a great scientific focus on atherosclerosis to a very broad agenda, American Heart Association, public health, um, international health. What, what's really important to you now? Uh, we talked about Bob Fry a few minutes ago, isn't it? Um, to me, I am a very lucky guy. So I have to tell you, so lucky that I can only say to you that um, if I can do something to move an inch in this huge world that can be meaningful, that's where I am. So my main mission, objective, is trying to do something. Since I have always been a team person, when you unify a mission and then the people who you work and trust, then you can imagine the number of projects that come out. So from this evolve, um, you know, after being president of the American Heart was interesting, but then when I moved to the World Heart Federation, I saw developing countries, what is going on. You cannot just sit there and say, well, this is for somebody else. So basically, this is what led me to get into more into public health. And I didn't forget anything that I'm doing in vascular biology, but there are teams of people working in different areas. And this is what I told you about New York. It's very exciting if you're able to work or to integrate people in different fields. And this is what is happening right now. So this thing in Spain, um, is it true that you spend half of your time in Spain and half no. your time in New York? Spend, I go every week there, but I don't spend half of my time. The, this is, um, uh, again, the, the, it's, it's, I don't think we should psychoanalyze ourselves why we do things. But the, the offer in Spain came at the moment that I was not entirely sure about New York uh, with, the, with the dean. And then both things click at the same time, so I got hooked up. What is exciting about Spain is for the first time we were able to put, this is like the NHLVI in Spain, we were able to put together federal funding with private funding. So 15 top 
enterprises, no pharmaceutical companies. I said no to that have really supported the research. Uh, they added uh, almost 40% to the national budget, to the federal budget. Uh, so I took it as a challenge, and it's very exciting. It's very, very exciting. And there, the mission is, to, is double. One is to find out who are the young people in the country at age 15, 16, 17 that are the future investigators. So we went to the whole system in supporting those people. And the second that you know very well is certainly translational research. There is a big gap between basic science and clinical application to the patient. So I, uh, I decided having the instruments, having the excitement of something new and to contribute to the country, I thought was good. However, it would be easy to say, well, go there once a month, impossible. If you want to make something to work, you have to be there. So. I go there once a week. Connection New York, Madrid is not, is not difficult. And I spend there a day, day and a half and come back. Do you sleep? <laughs> this issue of sleep, you're a scientist. It depends how deep you sleep. No, I don't sleep much. How but many I, hours I, of night do you sleep? Four. But very deep. And, and you see patients still, is that? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, many. And you do that in the early morning hours, or? Well, I see patients, you know, my day is maybe 15 hours or so. I would say spending with patients easily are about seven. And the rest is uh, research and administration. So it's still half time seeing patients. That's, that's uh, remarkable. Days are long. And what, what about children? Do you have children? Two. And what, what are they doing? Very interesting, uh, very different. Uh, our son is a very creative person. Um, he, uh, he has worked in music. He's now uh, building in a new type of bicycles. And uh, well, anybody who goes to the website will see. <laughs> very interesting person, very creative. And our daughter is an architect and, uh, in New York, married to another architect. I feel proud of both of them, quite different. Uh, quite different uh, people, but both are in New York, and uh, I enjoy both of them. Uh, of course, our son doesn't have the kind of uh, career with method right. that you and I had, so this always creates a little Entrepreneur bit and yeah, uncertainty. Yeah, involved uncertainty, in but on the other hand, you know, you know this is what he wants. Now our daughter is old method, and uh, they were all doing very well. My dad was an architect, so it's not easy for architects. So. No, very difficult, and both of them actually uh, were very well trained, and frankly, they are doing very nicely, but it's a difficult career, but which career is not is easy today? Right, right. You have to just move on and work. So Valentin, this has been fascinating for me, and uh, it, um, I, just one last question as, as we wrap it up here. If, if you look at the next five years, what do you want to accomplish? Uh, to have all the projects that I have, I have uh, five projects that are research oriented, and there are five projects that are in the world. Uh, I want that to crystallize with other people taking over. This would be my goal. So your goal is really to, um, it sounds like, then to have the things that are most important to you continue even if you're not there? Yeah, and then, you know, what I would like to do is I like writing. And, uh, and I already had written about four books. One was uh, actually translated here on health and so forth. I like writing a lot, and uh, you know, you accumulate over the years uh, not only experience but few concepts that you feel maybe of interest to transmit. And uh, you know, those of us who have been taking care of all the patients, complex, no complex, poor, rich, uh, and all of us who have been in the research arena, dealing with committees, uh, dealing with pressures. And uh, those of us who have been also in a part responsible of organizations, I think we, we learn a lot and if we can transmit this clearly to uh, young people, this would be a, a goal if my brain 
still works <laughs> after I finish uh, the thing we discussed today. So you pushed me to ask you one more question because I still remember last time you came to Duke, we almost had an insurrection by the fellows because of the advice you gave them. What they told them? Yeah, she told them to demand things from their uh, mentor. So Always. If I you were giving good. advice now to a cardiology fellow looking uh, for a career and a future, what would be the key advice? Uh, to be very naive and genuine and to, again, talk to the mentors in the way you feel. Uh, I think uh, to be sincere, to be open, to transmit clearly what you think to anybody at any level is always to be helpful. So this is what I would do. I would, what I would not do is try to sell anything to anybody. Uh, I think uh, sooner or later this doesn't work. So be crystalline clear, none of us is perfect. Therefore, we are all part of the same ball game. Fantastic advice, thanks. This has been a lot of fun talking with you. Thanks for joining me. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Robert. Thank you.